Hello everyone, thank you for joining me today. My name is Jane Lackey and today's seminar is called Women and Money, Taking Charge of Your Financial Future. Together we'll take a look at some unique financial challenges women often face and then some of the steps women can take to take charge of their financial futures. So let's get started. Like I said, my name is Janine Lackey. I'm a certified financial planner and investment advisor representative. I've been with Wild Wealth since 2008, but I've been in the industry since 2000. I do like to focus on a complete personal financial plan for all of my clients because I think that's important for every person when it comes to their investments. When it comes to our team, we have 15 financial advisors located in four separate offices. So we've got a wide variety of locations you can come to and advisors you can work with. When it comes to our staff, they also are in those four offices and we have 15 individuals to assist our clients in all different ways. So when it comes to charting your personal financial course, really in the past, women have taken a less active role in the financial decision-making for various reasons. But today, more women than ever are responsible for their personal financial well-being, the financial well-being of their families, and it's critical that women know how to save, invest, and plan for their future. Women today have never been in a better position to achieve financial security for themselves and their families. According to statistics, women make up almost half of the workforce. Women account for more than half of all workers in management, professional, and related occupations. Women own millions of businesses. Women earn the majority of all bachelor's, master's, and doctoral degrees. The bottom line is that the women's economic clout is significant. But when it comes to the road to financial security, women often face unique challenges that their male counterparts don't. So what are some of these key differences? Well, one of them is that women simply live longer. Women generally earn less income and have less savings. Women are more likely to interrupt their careers to raise children or take care of family members. Women may invest too conservatively. So let's take a look at each of these challenges and their consequences in more detail. So women have longer life expectancies is the first challenge. According to the most recent statistics, women on average live about five years longer than men. Most might say that it's fortunate for women, but a longer life expectancy has several financial consequences. Women are likely to spend more years in retirement and will need to stretch their retirement dollars further. Women are more likely to need some type of long-term care as they age, they may have to face some of their financial health care needs alone. Married women are st strategically likely to outlive their husbands, which means they'll probably have the sole responsibility for financial decisions, and then the final say on the disposition of the marital estate. The irony is that most women need their savings to last longer. They're typically confronted with other realities that make it harder to accumulate savings and amass significant income in later years, which brings us to challenge number two. Women generally earn less than men. According to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, women who work full-time earn only 82% on average of what men earn. The wage gap can impact overall savings, Social Security retirement benefits, and if you're lucky enough to have one, your pension. It also means women are more vulnerable to unexpected economic obstacles such as job loss, divorce, single parenthood, illness, 
in the loss of a spouse. So challenge number three, women are more likely to take time out of the workforce to raise children or to care for other family members, such as aging parents. Sometimes this is by choice, but moving in and out of the workforce has several significant financial impacts for women. Loss of income and employer benefits like retirement benefits and health insurance. Loss income means less savings. A potentially lower Social Security retirement benefit. This is because what you get from Social Security is based on the number of years you've worked and the amount that you've earned. Economic vulnerability in the event of a divorce or spouse losing their job. Potentially a more difficult time finding a job or a comparable job in terms of pay and benefits when they re-enter the workforce. And when women do attempt to stay in the workforce, there's more likely to request flexible work schedules to meet their primary caregiving responsibilities, which can impact their salaries in their long-term career. The challenge number four is that women may invest too conservatively to meet their financial objectives. Whether it's due to the fact women aren't maybe aware of their overall investment options, or they're generally just simply more risk adverse. The result of investing more conservatively over a long period of time could be that you might have an inadequate retirement next day. A loss of purchasing power due to inflation. And inflation refers to the increase of price of goods services over time. For example, in 1950, a gallon of milk cost 84 cents. In 1970, it was $1.35. In 1990, it doubled to $2.78. And today, a gallon roughly costs $3.75. So it's easy to see how purchasing power can decline if your savings doesn't keep up with inflation. The bottom line is simply risk equals reward. So before we go on, I want to mention there's no one size fits all here. That says not all women will face all of these challenges. Obviously, there are many different lifestyles and life stages and characteristics that define women. Single, married, widowed, employed, small business owner, breadwinner, stay-at-home mom, empty nester, retired investor, knowledgeable investor, beginning investor, and so on. That being said, statistically speaking, a majority of women are likely to face at least some of the challenges that I've just noted. It's important for women to be aware of all of them as they move forward financially, regardless of what stage of life they're in. So now, what are some of the things that women can take responsibility for in their financial well-being? There's six steps. Take control of your money. Become a more knowledgeable investor. Advocate for yourself in the workplace. Plan for retirement. Protect your income and assets. Create an estate, estate, create an estate plan. So let's look at these areas in more detail. So taking control of your money. First and foremost, it means no matter what life stage you're in, realizing that you have responsibility of your own financial well-being. This means knowing what your cash flow is, what you have coming in every month, and what you have leaving going out the door. Establishing positive cash flow by budgeting, managing debt, and living within your means. Creating an emergency fund. Part of budgeting is establishing an emergency fund so that you'll have money readily available to meet unexpected expenses. Without a financial cushion, you may have to fall back on credit cards with high interest rates to meet some cash needs, and obviously we don't want to do that. Establish and maintain good credit. How do you do that? Pay your bills on time and don't carry too many credit cards. Just so you know, 
everyone's entitled to a free copy of their credit report each year from the three main credit reporting agencies. And I always like to say it's a good idea to re review your report periodically, just to make sure it's accurate. Set clear financial goals. Again, if you're married, this is probably a team effort. Short-term goals may include something like your cash reserves, making sure it's adequately, adequately funded, or paying off a credit card. Long-term goals would include something like saving for a new home, retirement, maybe your kid's college education. Well, once you've done all of these things, you're ready to start saving and investing your money, which brings us to step two. Step two is becoming a more knowledgeable investor. Some of you here today may have a handle of your family finances all along, while others may be new to the world of investing. No matter what your level of expertise is, there's always room to learn more and adjust your plan based on your current circumstances. Many women will end up being solely responsible for their own financial well being at some point in their lives, so it's critical that they have a sound understanding in the investment world and the confidence to make appropriate investment decisions. So let's talk about determining appropriate investment strategies and the fact that it isn't an exact science, but there are some steps you can take to help get started. So if you're just starting out and being a beginning investor, Get some basic information, start to educate yourself. Take small steps. You don't have to learn everything at once. Don't postpone getting started. The longer you wait, the fewer options you may have. And don't be afraid to ask questions. If you're a more experienced investor, make sure your portfolio is in line with your investment goals and time horizon and risk tolerance. Look for ways to manage risk. The key is to maximize investment return at a level of risk that you're comfortable with. Understand what you own and the role each investment plays in your portfolio. Keep an eye out for investing ideas. Consider the impact of taxes, fees, trading costs, and inflation. If you've amassed a substantial amount of assets, you might benefit from expert help in the areas of tax planning, estate planning, and asset protection. And have a game to adjust accordingly and avoid that knee-jerk reaction in, in volatile markets. So becoming a more knowledgeable investor includes other things too. It means being willing to admit mistakes, deal with them, and simply move on. Be risk adverse in the right way. While investing conservatively can be a good strategy at times, for other long-term goals like retirement, it can be a liability. If you're married, make sure both of you know your account numbers, your passwords, and online access, information for all investment and loan accounts. Sometimes one spouse assumes primarily that responsibility for the investment's decisions, whether it's by choice or by habit, but it's important the other partner knows how to access the accounts to be able to handle the bills and investment decisions in, the, in case the, the other one is not able to. Also know when to get professional help. Being a good investor doesn't mean you have to do everything yourself. A financial professional can help you create an appropriate investment strategy, specific investments, and make adjustments as necessary. Now I wanna switch subjects a bit and talk about step number three, which is advocating for yourself in the workplace. It's important because in order to take steps toward financial securities, you need a source of income. For many women, that income comes from their jobs. So what women can do to maximize their potential income. When possible, women need to negotiate their starting salary for two reasons. One, more money now 
means more money to potentially save and invest. And two, your salary is the foundation in which other employee benefits are built. For example, the percentage amount that you contribute to your 401k is dependent upon your salary. So for example, if you save 10% and you have a $70,000 salary, that obviously is gonna be more money if you do 10% at a $50,000 salary. So over many years, that amount can add up. Now, negotiating your starting salary doesn't mean you're gonna get what you want. Some employers can't or won't negotiate, but you should be aware of the important role of your starting salary pays in the overall financial picture. So as women move forward in a job, really, they need to research their ongoing salary. You can do that by going online to career and salary websites to see what your area in that industry traditionally pays. Women need to speak up on their accomplishments, take challenging assignments, and ask for raises and promotions. Some women need to ask for flexibility when it's needed because, right, you've, you've got your family to help raise or your parents to help take care of, and flexibility is needed. So when it comes to work-life balance, yes, that's kind of an HR buzzword, but the fact is for many women, job flexibility is important. Sometimes it allows them to be a telecommuter or have flexible hours. For example, working seven to three instead of nine to five, or even working part-time. For many women, leaving the workforce entirely isn't an option. Their husbands might not earn enough to support the entire family, or they may actually be out of work. Women might have their own debts, like student loans they want to repay, or women may be living on their own and are their family's sole breadwinner. Whatever the reason, job flexibility is key. Options like telecommuting, flexible hours, part-time work, all of those can help women remain in the workforce. Some employers actually offer and embrace these type of arrangements where others don't, but it never hurts to ask. Looking into the future, flexible work environments are likely to be a growth trend as women seek to blend their work and home lives into a satisfactory way rather than just accept the scenario that's given. So let's talk a little bit about planning for retirement. So step number four, this is obviously very critical for women. And unfortunately, women tend to have lower retirement balances, social security benefits and pension benefits. The number one thing women can do today is to start saving. So on this table, you can see how $2,000 a year saved starting at 20, 30, 40, 50, or 60 years old, how much you will have saved by the time you are 65. We also did a, a chart for 5,000 and 10,000. So really what you can see is the sooner you start, obviously the better. So in addition to starting to save early, it's important to get in the habit of saving as much money as you can, no matter what. Even if you're staying at home, raising a family, you too can add and should save for retirement. Think of savings of retirement as putting yourself first. Get rid of excuses like, I'm too busy to plan. I don't know enough about investing. My husband takes care of our finances. I'll save money once my children are through college. Your retirement savings has to be priority. If your employer offers retirement savings plans, such as a 401k or a 403b, start contributing as much as you can, especially if your employer matches. Consider contributing to IRAs, traditional Roth or spousal IRAs, 
one, if your employer doesn't offer a plan, or two, if you're not able to be in the workforce. And set savings goals that you wanna to work towards and keep track of your progress, monitoring your investments and make changes as needed. A financial professional can actually help you here. And now I kinda of wanna take a different route and talk about something else that's very important to women in retirement. It's our social security. So social security is a major source of guaranteed lifetime income for most Americans. Guaranteed means that once you start taking the monthly social security retirement benefit, you will get that money every month for as long as you live. Now, I know every year the trustees of the Social Security publish a report on the solvency of the program, where they note the current form, Social Security won't be able to pay out benefits in the future that people expect, and that raises concern. So the question is, does this mean that Social Security will disappear entirely? Not probably. What it does mean is that there probably will be changes that calm down in the future when it comes to the Social Security. Whatever changes happen is anyone's guess, so all we can do is really plan on what we know today. So let's take a look at Social Security a little more. So ever since 1940, when a legal secretary named Ida May Fuller received the first Social Security retirement check, women have been counting on Social Security to provide a much needed retirement income. Social Security also provides disability and survivor benefits, but today we're gonna to focus on retirement benefits. To qualify for retirement benefits, you generally need 40, credit, 40 credits, which is about 10 years of work, or you can actually qualify for spousal benefits based on your spouse's work record. Traditionally, that's going to come in at about 50%. Now, how much can you expect from Social Security? So the amount you'll receive on Social Security is based on a number of years you've worked in a, and you've made a living, you've earned an income. Your benefit is, is calculated using a formula that takes into account your highest 35 earning years. If you've earned little or nothing in several of those, it might be to your advantage to actually work a little longer because you might have the opportunity to, to replace one of those lower earning years with a higher earning year, potentially resulting in a higher retirement benefit. You can get an estimate of what your monthly retirement benefit will be by going to ssa.gov and using, using the retirement in retirement estimator tool or actually viewing your own personal statement. So if you think you haven't received a statement in a while, if you're between the ages 25 and 60, you actually get them in the mail every five years. Once you turn 60, you start receiving it every single year. At the age in which you start Claiming Social Security also affects what you receive. You can choose to start taking retirement benefits at 62, but if you do so, your monthly benefit will re be reduced somewhere between 25 and 30 percent less than if you had waited to a full retirement Social Security age, which is traditionally at this point 66 or 67, depending on the year you were born. Now, if you choose to wait and pull Social Security a little later, around 70, you could actually earn up to about 32% more simply by deferring and waiting to pull benefits. So this chart illustrates a hypothetical person and what they might get by taking Social Security benefits at different ages. It's based on a full retirement age of 67 and a benefit of $2,000 a month. As you can see, if you start pulling benefits at 62, you'll get about $1,400 a month or 30% less. But if you wait until age 70, you'll get 
$2,480 a month, which is about 24% more. Now remember this monthly benefit is guaranteed every month for as long as you live. So it's an important question as you approach your 60s is when you should start taking Social Security. And there's no right answer. It's an individual decision that must be based on many factors, such as other sources of retirement income, your life expectancy, your marital status, whether you plan to continue working after taking benefits, and your tax picture. A financial professional can help you evaluate these factors. As a woman, you should pay particularly close attention to how much retirement income, Social Security, will be provided. So finally, as you approach and enter retirement, there are some things you'll need to think about. When will you retire? What, were, what will your retirement expenses look like? Keep in mind that you can live the richest lifestyle in retirement if your expenses are low and the outstanding debt obligations are modest. How do you plan to deal with a shortfall if your retirement reserves aren't sufficient? Healthcare expenses. Many people underestimate the amount they'll need to spend on healthcare in retirement. Even though Medicare covers most Americans starting at 65, it doesn't cover every healthcare need. Longevity issues. According to the U.S. Census Bureau, not only do women live longer than men, but women also make up the majority of older Americans living in poverty, and women overwhelmingly outnumber men in skilled nursing facilities after age 65. Finally, you'll need to understand your retirement plan distribution options, the best order to tap your retirement accounts, and what safe withdrawal rate you should take so you don't outlive your money. As you can see, there's a lot to think about here. So now let's move on from retirement and talk about step number five, protecting your income and assets. Unfortunately, women often overlook the need to do this. So how do you protect your income and assets from risk? Traditionally, you do it with insurance. Insurance transfers the risk from you and your family to an insurance company. So some types of insurance to consider, life insurance, disability insurance. A lot of people think disability is not going to happen to them, but with an independent disability policy, um, traditionally it's gonna replace 50 to 70% of your income if you can't work due to disability. Home and auto insurance, health insurance, long-term care insurance, and finally, there are some instances where, where insurance just simply doesn't cover it. So you need to look for protection other places. Trusts, if you have significant assets, a trust can help shield assets from creditors' lawsuits. In business entities, many professionals such as doctors and lawyers may face financial damages for the result from performance of their professional duties. The bottom line is that if you haven't developed and implemented an asset protection plan, your wealth and assets are vulnerable to the risks of everyday life. And last but not least, step number six, create an estate plan. Now I know the word estate plan sounds a little bit intimidating, but estate plan is simply a map that reflects the way you want your personal and financial affairs handled in the case of your incapacity or death. It allows you to control what happens to you and your property. For example, do you wanna leave your legacy to friends or family? Do you wanna donate a portion to your estate to charity? You want to ensure that the good friend gets the antique coffee table. You have thoughts about what type of medical intervention you want after an accident in the event you couldn't speak for yourself. 
by putting the state plan together and in place now, while you still have the mental capacity to do so, not only will you have a say in what happens to your property, but you also make it easier for the loved ones to cope if something unexpected should happen because your family members will know your final wishes. So when it comes to creating an estate plan, what sort of things can women do to plan? So let's talk about incapacity versus death. So the first side, right, a living will. Living will is a document that lists the type of medical treatment you would want or not want under a particular situation. Healthcare proxy, or also known as durable power of attorney for healthcare, lets someone in your family other than yourself make medical decisions for you when you're not able to. The DNR order or do not resuscitate order is pretty self-explanatory. A power of attorney and a living trust. All of those allow someone to step in and help organize your assets, your finances, your health care if you're not able to. Now, planning for death, a topic no one likes to think about, but what should you consider having? You should consider having a will. Your will is Typically, the cornerstone of your estate plan is a legal document that directs how your property is to be distributed at your death. A testamentary trust is a trust created in your will and is a legal arrangement that allows you to provide various interests to different beneficiaries. So what happens if you die without a will? If you die without a will, your property is passed according to your state's laws. Obviously, this differs depending on the state that you live in. However, whether you have a will or not, some property will actually pass automatically to other people. For example, a property that's owned jointly called rights of survivorship will pass to that other person that's listed on that deed a 401k or life insurance policy that has a beneficiary, the benefits that investments will pass to that beneficiary regardless of who's named in the will. So for women with significant assets, more advanced estate planning may be necessary. Let's talk about overcoming some unexpected job obstacles. Obviously, losing your job is usually unexpected. Unplanned pregnancy, divorce, illness, adult children needing help financially, our parents needing help, the spouse passing away. When you take steps to strengthen your financial future, not only will you be in a better position to enjoy life in good times, but you'll also be in a better position to cope with times that are not so good, which many of us are likely to face at some point in time in our lives. In fact, it's often during these stressful times that many women turn to financial professionals for help. In the end, it's all about you, your goals, your dreams, your security. What financial course will you chart? By taking time to plan your financial future, you gain peace of mind knowing that you're doing all you can to provide for yourself and your family. In our busy, full, exciting lives, I'm guessing you could use a bit more peace of mind. I wanted to thank you for joining me today and remind you that taking small steps can enhance your financial life by taking one day at a time. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me and I wish you all a wonderful rest of your day.